Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, the Lord gives the constitution for the kingdom. You see, one of these days the Lord is going to come back on a white horse with ten thousands of his saints. And this is when he's going to set up his kingdom on earth. And this is the kingdom of heaven. And we read about when we read about the kingdom of heaven, don't think of the third heaven where God presently is. This is a physical kingdom on this earth where Jesus Christ will be king reigning on a physical throne in Jerusalem. And this chapter is not directed to the church. It's the Lord laying down the rules for the coming millennial kingdom. It will be his kingdom, his rules. So let's look at some of the things. First off, who are the citizens of the kingdom? Who are they going to be? In Matthew 5, 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So the Lord is about to give the disciples some private lessons here. And it says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So the Lord opened his mouth. He knew there was a time to speak. Ecclesiastes 3, 7 says, A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. He also knew there would be a time to keep silent. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth so the disciples they're being taught by the same mouth he opened his mouth and taught them they're being taught by the same mouth that will soon hold a sharp two-edged sword at the second coming a sharp two-edged sword is going to proceed out of the same mouth that taught the disciples and imagine being taught by the lord jesus christ himself and this is your future if you're saved in the kingdom the lord is going to teach in Micah 4, 5, it says, And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. So what kind of citizens does the Lord want in his kingdom? He's going to describe some. Poor in spirit. In Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The men that King Jesus wants in his kingdom are humble servants. And blessed means happy. Uh, the, the people the Lord wants to go into the physical kingdom of heaven on earth will be the poor in spirit. You're going, whether you are poor in spirit or not, if you're, if you're saved in this age, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and you're going no matter what you do. Because you're blessed to have lived in this time period where you, you're going to have a glorified body at the rapture, and when the kingdom takes place, you're going right in. You're coming back with the Lord on a white horse to set up the kingdom, and then you're going in the kingdom. But at the same time, let this remind you to be humble. Let this remind you to be poor in spirit. In Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Isaiah 66, 2, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. So the Lord does not like a cocky, haughty, prideful spirit. But imagine living in a kingdom where everyone knew they didn't deserve to be there. Imagine living in a kingdom where the people didn't feel like the world owed them something. They knew they owed the world to the Lord Jesus. Imagine living in a kingdom where nobody ever stuck down their nose at you or stuck it up in the air at you and just kept it out of your business. Everybody will know they are only there because Jesus Christ, and if it wasn't for him, they would be in hell. When you got saved, you showed yourself poor in spirit. At that moment, you knew you weren't righteous enough to save yourself. You changed your mind about yourself, and you turned to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. But remember, these verses have little to nothing to do with me and you. But we can get practical application from them. And the cockiest Christian you know today will still enter the kingdom. Because the Lord's looking at the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your record not at your own personal righteousness or unrighteousness. The thing is, he just probably won't have any reign in the kingdom, the cocky Christian. He may be suffering, 
in this life, but is but is it all for himself or is it for the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're suffering for the Lord, then you will reign in the kingdom. So that's the poor in spirit, but next is mourners. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This has to be talking about a time in the future because all kinds of people mourn the entirety of their life but are never comforted. Apply this to a tribulation saying about to enter the millennium and you've got it. Apply it spiritually speaking and remind yourself about the rapture. Read 1 Thessalonians 4 and comfort yourself with those words. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Ecclesiastes 7 2 says it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. Ecclesiastes 7 3 Sorrow is better than laughter for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The people who were right with God wouldn't have had true comfort until they went into the physical kingdom of heaven. Until they go in there, they won't have real comfort. But it's better to go to the house of mourning. Applying this practically for you today, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Your eternity will made, be made better if you are in mourning about something pertaining to God and the lost souls of people. Me and you can't presently have true comfort, or we can presently have true comfort because spiritually we have already entered the kingdom of God, and that's a spiritual kingdom. That's not the physical kingdom of heaven. But when you got the moment you got saved, you entered into the spiritual kingdom of God. That's why you can presently have comfort. At the same time, the more mourning that me and you do for the lost, the more comfort we're going to have in the millennial kingdom, the more rain we'll have. More suffering in the present will make the rapture even more comforting. The more suffering I face in the world, the more I will look forward to the rapture. The uglier the world gets, the sweeter the rapture becomes, the more beautiful it becomes, the more, the more dreaded the rapture will be in our minds, the more uglier this world gets. But if you keep in mind about that coming kingdom and about the rapture, you're going to be comforted in your mind. In the kingdom, you will live with the poor in spirit who spent their time mourning. Uh, these are people that care about others. Imagine living in a kingdom where the people actually care about other people. Now, next is the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, this one is very obvious. Meek people are not inheriting the earth today. This is obviously in the future kingdom. Uh, where the Lord's people get the land and faithful Christians from the church age will have reign over cities as well. But what does meek mean exactly? Looking up Webster's definition, it says mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked or irritated, yielding, given to forbearance under injury, injuries, appropriately humble. In an evangelical sense, submissive to the divine will, not proud, self-sufficient, or refractory, not peevish and apt to complain of divine dispensations. That's Webster's definition. And for a good example of meekness, see Moses. In Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. A meek person is lowly and puts themselves under the authority of God's words and doesn't try to usurp authority over it. Because, you know, they're poor in spirit. Men try to put authority over the word of God like the Pharisees did with their traditions. But imagine living in a kingdom where the people are united under God's word and that's the absolute standard. So to be meek people, poor in spirit people, and those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Contrast this with today, where men... Their God is their belly. They are hungry for sin and their self. And these things don't fill. When all you want is sin and self, those things don't fulfill. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the appetite is not filled. In this world, you have everyone going around eating, drinking, and doing everything they want. They are depressed and miserable 
incomplete and they can't be satisfied. That's why hell is never full, because the eyes of men are never satisfied. You have men who hungered and thirsted after righteousness and are continuing to do so. Then when the kingdom comes, they are filled. And the table turns, and this world is set up by the God of this world now. It caters to the wicked now. But the world to come is set up by the king of kings, and it is for the righteous. The people of today have a God that is their belly, and out of their the belly of the righteous flows rivers of living water. In John 7, 38. But in the tribulation, the ones who hunger and thirst will turn down the mark and worship of the Antichrist, the ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You won't see them getting the mark. They're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, not for the temporal things of this world. They have esteemed the words of his mouth more than their necessary food. See Job 23, 12. And the words are compared to food themselves. You have the word being compared to an apple in Proverbs 25, 11, to water in Ephesians 5, 26, to bread in Luke 4, 4, strong meat in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, milk in 1 Peter 2, 2, honey in Psalm 119, 103. The word is sweet, Revelation 10.10, 10, and bitter, Revelation 10 and verse 10. So come to God hungry for the word, and he will fill you with the spirit. Have you ever got so used to a daily time in the word that you become hangry for the word if you didn't have it? Kind of like you are with food. But who's the citizen of his kingdom? They're going to be, the citizens of his kingdom are going to be hunger, hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Now the next thing, merciful, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Enter the kingdom and enter a world of mercy. In this world you have people who pride themselves in showing no mercy. If the God of heaven can show mercy to man, then surely a sinful man can show mercy to another sinful man. Surely you can do that. You can apply this to yourself today in the sense that if you are merciful to a brother, he probably show it right back. But that God didn't give you mercy because you were merciful to others. In this time period, he gave you mercy because you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that reason, he's keeping you from something you do deserve, which is hell. Now, the next thing is pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are those, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This can't be referring to today because the lying spirits and Satan himself can see God. See Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, 1 Kings 22, 21 through 22. And see that Satan and lying spirits both go into the presence of God. So this has to refer to a future day once again. In the millennium, the devil is chained and unclean spirits are made to pass out of the land so they don't see God. The pure in heart of the tribulation will go right on into the millennium. And Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So there's coming a day when only the pure in heart are going to see God. Me and you are considered pure in heart, in the sense that when God sees me, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. And imagine living in the land of those who have a pure heart. You'll always know their heart's in the right place. So, citizens of the kingdom are pure in heart. Citizens of the kingdom are peacemakers. In Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And remember, you don't just go to Matthew chapter 5. If you want to be saved, you don't go to Matthew chapter 5 and say, hey, if I be a peacemaker, I'll be saved and going to the kingdom. That's not what this is about. You, can, you don't apply this in that way to yourself today, you see. If you want to be saved and go into the kingdom, when that kingdom comes, you come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What you have here is the Lord going over the constitution for the coming kingdom that you will just automatically be a part of just for getting saved today and being on the Lord's side, you see. In Micah 4.3, it says, And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. It's going to be a time of peace. Solomon had a reign of peace on every side at the beginning of his reign. This picture is the Lord's reign. You see, all the fighting is done at the second coming. Then we live in complete peace under the authority of the king. 
Just like all the fighting was done under David's reign, David pictures Jesus coming back at the second coming. All the fighting was done then, and then Solomon reign pictures Jesus on the throne in the millennium because it's a reign of peace. The disciples themselves were peacemakers because it wasn't yet time to bring in the kingdom. Remember how in John 18, 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. So, see, the disciples were peacemakers because it wasn't time to bring in the kingdom yet. And remember how the Lord was upset with Peter for cutting off the ear of Malchus? That's because it wasn't time to fight yet. It was time to be crucified and die for the sins of the whole world. And in your life today, you should be a peacemaker. You shouldn't be the one starting all the drama. It says in Romans twelve eighteen, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. There's going to be a time to fight. That's at the second coming. But right now, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're to live peaceably with all men if we can. That doesn't mean uh, compromising and going along with the sinful things that they do. It just means, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. There's coming a day we're going to fight with the Lord at the second coming, but then it'll be true peace in the kingdom. There will never be true peace until the king sits on the throne of his kingdom. Now next, who else? The persecuted. In Matthew 5.10 it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A person in a tribulation who isn't giving into the Antichrist policies will be persecuted, suffering, and probably beheaded. But his is the kingdom of heaven. He's simply trading the temporal pleasure of the Antichrist kingdom for the eternal pleasure of the Lord in his kingdom. Matthew 5.11 Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Are people bashing you for the Lord's name or for your name? The tribulation saints will have men speaking evil against them falsely. This is because during the time, during that coming time, the righteous become the lawbreakers. They will be persecuted, looked on as an enemy, a bad person, a villain, as someone who's holding up progress. And it's going to take a lot of guts to be a tribulation saint, but the payoff is going to be unbelievable. So he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In the kingdom you're going to be living with people who died for the faith, lost their family for the faith, faith, lost everything they had for the Lord's sake. And these are going to be grateful and thankful, appreciative people. Imagine living with people that are that way. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's for a church age saying. If you live godly, you're going to suffer persecution in some way. But in the previous chapter, 2 Timothy 2.12, it said, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So if we, we're gonna, if we live godly, we will suffer. But if you suffer, you're going to reign. You're going to have more reign. Matthew 5.11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Notice that against you falsely. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3.16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good, good conversation in Christ. When you're falsely accused and slandered because of a righteous life, your reward will be great. So rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Look at those Old Testament prophets and get courage to go against the world. When the world hates you, be glad about it. And next, you're going to have people in the kingdom who are salt and light. In Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. The Jews were the salt of the earth because of God's covenants of salt with them. In Leviticus 2.13, it records God's covenant of salt for sacrifices. Numbers 18.19 records God's covenant of salt for the Arianic priesthood. And 2 Chronicles 13.5 records God's covenant of salt for the Davidic kingdom. So they were the salt of the earth, but they lost their savor because they picked up impurities in these covenants. 
You see, they were supposed to be sacrificing to God. They started sacrificing the idols. They were supposed to have priests from the that were the tribe of Levi, specifically Aaron and his sons, but they picked up priests from the wrong tribe. They quit sacrificing to God. They sacrificed to devils, and they said they had no king but Caesar when they were supposed to have a king that was of the line of David. So they lost their savor. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. They were cast out by Nebuchadnezzar and also by Titus in 70 A.D. And you have men that will be cast out into a lake of fire and trodden under foot of men in the tribulation. See Daniel 8.13 and at the second coming. When those white horses come. In the kingdom what you'll have is people that are salt and haven't lost their savor. And you can be salt today. It says in Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. When your speech doesn't have salt, it makes it hard for people to relate. Sometimes shock value in what you say can get someone's attention. But it says, You are the light of the world. In Matthew five fourteen. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The city is Jerusalem, the focal point of history. The Jews were to be children of light, just like the church is the light today. The light needs to be seen of men. In Philippians 2.15, it says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. When people come into a room, you're going to stick out. You're not doing what everyone else is doing. You're supposed to be a light. And it's, so he says in verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You see, you don't light a candle and put it under a bushel. A bushel is a basket. Uh, don't put the stuff in your basket over the light of the candle. This shows your priorities are messed up. Put the candle at the top of everything so that it gives light to everyone around you. And it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your good works shouldn't shine, your good works shouldn't, but rather draw attention to the light. So then the Father gets the glory and not you. You don't want your good works getting to get the glory. You want your Father to get the glory. Now next, what kind of citizens are going to be in the kingdom? Citizens that are more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. In Matthew 5, 17, it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, Jesus didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled all righteousness. Keeping the law and offering the prescribed sacrifice when you broke it was how to stay in the mercy of God under the Old Testament law. But Jesus came and fulfilled the law. And now you get righteousness by believing on him. And Romans 10, 3 through 4, it says, For they being ignorant, ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see, Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. People uh, keeping the law and offering the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it to uh, stay in some type of temporary righteousness. That was done away when the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. He became the perfect sacrifice for sin, a permanent sacrifice that got rid of sin permanently because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And Matthew five seventeen says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come to destroy the prophets. The prophets wrote of him. And he fulfilled their prophecies at the first coming. And he's going to fulfill even more at the second coming. He didn't come to destroy the prophets. He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The jot or tittle are the Hebrew characters in which the Old Testament was written. And something as small as the dot on an I will not be forgotten. Notice the importance the Lord places on the words of the law. One jot. Or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Yet people want to take away whole verses from it. But he says in verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. They only could falsely accuse Jesus of breaking 
the commandments. In John 9, 16, they were uh, constantly accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. It's one of the least commandments. It was a sign between God and Israel. The church is under no obligation to keep the Sabbath day. The Pharisees love to accuse Jesus, though, of breaking the Sabbath. However, the Pharisees constantly broke the commandments that weren't the least commandments of God. They, they're not going to be ones that go into the kingdom. Imagine living in a kingdom without hypocrites. That's what the Pharisees were. He says in Matthew 5, 24, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Pharisees say and do not. They knew the law, but they didn't keep it. They would only accuse others of breaking it and put burdens on others that they themselves couldn't bear. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Imagine living in a kingdom without these hypocrites, but living in a kingdom with men who are more righteous than these guys. Not only do they know what to do, but they will also do it and not be hypocrites. So that's the citizens of the kingdom. Now let's look at the consequences of the kingdom. Sometimes people get the idea that sin and death are done away after the second coming. However, there will still be sin and death in the millennium. These things aren't done away until after the great white throne. You see, the Lord will have consequences set up as a deter deterrent to crime. And these are going to be devastating consequences. In Matthew 5.21, it says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. You see, the judgment was when the avenger of blood comes after the killer. And the Lord is turning things up a notch here. They already knew it was wrong to kill. However, what drives a person to kill? He says in the next verse, What I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in the danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, the hard attitude towards your brother is what leads to murder. You shouldn't hate your brother. In 1 John 3.15 it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Notice Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, showing that it is okay to be angry if there is a cause. Paul even said in Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So he says in Matthew 5.22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the counsel. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So what's that Rekha? Rekha means vain fellow, a worthless fool or empty, vain or foolish. This has nothing to do with me and you. These are instructions for the kingdom. I mean, you're not going to be calling somebody Rekha anyway. So don't be worried about, you know, well, I've, I, I called somebody a fool or a bad name and I'm, I'm going to hell for that. No, this is, this is instructions for the kingdom. In the millennium kingdom, there's not going to be a legit reason to call your brother a fool or Rekha without doing it without a cause. There's not going to be a reason that you're angry. There's probably not going to be very many reasons that you can be angry with your brother. The, the rules will be clear. The doctrine will be clear. Jesus will be visibly seen on the throne, and it will be clear what he expects. So to call a f someone a fool out of anger, that is, without a cause, during that time period is going to be serious business. And if you do, you will be in danger of hellfire. There are consequences in the millennium. If you call your brother Rekha, then you're going to be in danger of the council. And the only good council in the Bible, this is the one Jesus Christ set up in the millennium. In Matthew 5.23 it says, Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Once again, it's very clear that this has nothing to do with us today. We don't have an altar. However, you can still get the spiritual application. Be reconciled to your brother before you offer something to the Lord. And, I mean, we don't bring offerings to the Lord in the sense that they used to back then either. But before you, you know, offer up praise or prayer to the Lord, why not be reconciled to your brother? That's a good 
application to go by there. And Matthew 5.25, agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. So this means if you have done somebody wrong, then agree with his accusations quickly. Why? To avoid him delivering you to the judge, then the judge delivering you to the officer, and then you being cast into prison. The thing is that you need to right your wrongs before the judgment takes place. And you even need to do that in your Christian life as well. Right your wrongs before judgment takes place on you. It says in 1 Corinthians 11.31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. So make peace with your adversary quickly before the judge gets involved. And another way to look at it is that when you were lost, when you were lost, God was your enemy. And you got reconciled to God before he became your judge. If you hadn't been reconciled, then you would have been judged as a sinner and cast into hell, which is way worse than prison. Verily I say unto you, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Meaning, they don't get out until they have paid the very last penny for restitution. And when it comes to hell, you would never get out because only Jesus could pay the debt off that you owed and you rejected his payment. So it would be eternally paid in hell. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Everyone knew committing adultery was wrong. The Lord's going to take it a step further. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Adultery is something that you can commit with the body and the mind. You see, the world is designed in a way to keep your eyes full of adultery. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. You see, in the Lord's kingdom it would be better to cut off whatever is causing you to sin than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Notice it isn't the soul, just the soul going to hell like today. It's the whole body. In the kingdom you are at risk of being thrown in alive. Just like Korah back there in Numbers went down alive into the pit when he went against Moses. This is because during the millennium, a consequence in the kingdom is being tossed bodily into a lake of fire that is visible on the earth. And it talks about this in the Old Testament in Isaiah 66, 23 through 24. It says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. When those other nations come in to Jerusalem to worship the king, they're going to see those people in the lake of fire, and that's going to be a deterrent to crime. That's a consequence in the kingdom. And in Isaiah 34, 8 through 11, it talks about it. For it's the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. And it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. So the Lord at the second coming, he's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance. The fire from that second coming, some of that's going to be left on the earth to make up a lake of fire on the earth. Imagine living in a kingdom where the crime is low because there is a visible lake of fire there as a deterrent to crime. Matthew 5.30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It would be better to lose an eye than to have both eyes and be cast into hell. So he says in Matthew 18, 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. As a Christian, you are in no danger of going to hell. What 
what can you take from these verses? Well, you can mortify your members on the earth. It will be better for you to put down the flesh and serve God than to live for the flesh and die early. Because it says in Romans 8, 13, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Put down your eyes. Put down your hands and feet if they're causing you to sin. Don't cut them off, obviously. But you can mortify your members on the earth. Notice the Lord talked about the eye and then mentions adultery in the next verse. I think that's significant because the eyes play a huge part in adultery. Mix this with immodest dress, dress with women and it's like starting a fire. 2 Peter 2.14 talks about having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. And in Matthew 5.31-32, through 32, he talks about divorce and, and, and fornication. And then the very next verses, it says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. It's commonly taught that fornication and adultery are two different things. I mean, it's taught wrong that way. But fornication is sex with anyone that you're not married to, even if you are married. The act of adultery is a form of fornication. So if a spouse steps out on you and lies with another person, then a divorce isn't wrong on, on your part. You could get a divorce. However, this doesn't mean you have to get a divorce. You see, adultery is always fornication, but fornication is not all, always adultery. Fornication is sex with someone you aren't married to, even if you are married to somebody. And see, adultery can be committed with the mind or the body. Fornication is the physical act with the body. With someone you're not married to. Adultery is fornication. Now next. You got communication in the kingdom. We've seen the citizens. We've seen the consequences. Now what's the communication going to be like? The talk in the kingdom will be cleaner than any G movie you've ever seen. You'll be able to take a man at his word. You won't even need to shake on it. In Matthew 5, 33, it says, Again, ye have heard that hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but, but shall perform the Lord thine oaths. Forswear means to swear falsely. And the Lord actually says to swear not at all. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. How do, you, how do people swear by heaven? Well, they say, my heavens, for heaven's sake. Uh, and then he says, don't swear by the earth, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So how do people swear by the earth? They say things like, my lands. Uh, if this isn't even uh, more of a dead giveaway that the context is about the millennial reign, notice Jesus Christ will reign as king from, from Jerusalem. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Put in the context of the millennium. It says, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. How do you swear by the head? Well, it's like swearing on your life. Some people say, as sure as I live and breathe, I'll not do this. Or simply just say, I swear on my life. It says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You don't need to add anything to the truth. In his kingdom, your yea will be yea and your nay, nay. The communication will be right. The conduct will be right. In Matthew 5.28 it says, Ye have heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Just like in Exodus 21, 24 through 25. But he says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. This doesn't mean be a pushover. It means in the kingdom you can overcome evil with good. And most times getting angry and hitting someone back is something you regret. The same is true for today. Just because a man punches you in the face doesn't mean you have to retaliate. It says in Romans twelve nineteen, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But he goes on in Matthew five forty through 43, And if any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat. Let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thy way. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. 
So so he says in Levit- it says back in Leviticus nineteen eighteen, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. If you do that, you're not going to have problems with these little commandments like this that he's given in the kingdom. The Lord seems to change things up here. Remember how David said he hated the enemy in Psalm 139, 21 and 22? Now Jesus says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Since Jesus Christ was coming down to die for his enemies, just like a friend you see, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, that's the way we need to be with our enemies. We can easily put Matthew five forty four on us today. Paul reinforces it. If you look at Romans twelve seventeen through 21, he talks about recompensing to no man evil for evil. He talks about overcoming evil with good. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45, that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So he's just pretty much talking about how you don't need to be a respect of persons. Be good to everybody. Notice that it said that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. See, this can't apply to us because me and you are already God's children. And that's further proof it's not directly to us today in this chapter. We've already became sons of God in John 1, 12. When we believe we became sons of God, the same sun that shines on your head shines on every lost man's head. The same rain that falls at your house falls at the lost man's house. He makes the sun and the rain to fall on the evil and the good. He says, For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? If the only people you love are the ones that love you, then how are you different than the lost world? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? If you only salute your little group, then how are you different than the lost world? He's talking about not being impartial. Don't be a respective persons. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in, in heaven is perfect. Imperfect in the context of what? not being a respecter of persons. And obviously, perfect can't mean sinless perfection. And the best verse I know of to prove that it doesn't is 1 Kings fifteen fourteen, where it talks about Asa, and it says, But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. So the high places weren't removed, yet his heart was still perfect. So perfect doesn't mean sinless perfection. And in the context here in Matthew 5, it's perfect in the sense you're not being a respect of persons. You're, you're just treating everybody the same. Everybody's going to be treated the same in the kingdom. That's going to be the conduct in the kingdom. So this has been Matthew chapter 5. What's the kingdom going to be like? What's the kingdom going to be like living with all these people that know how to act? It's going to be a different world.